Hello, I'm Cameron, and welcome to Advocation Nation podcast, a podcast dedicating to highlighting different advocacy stories and journeys from many walks of life. I decided to start this podcast with the goal of educating people about the many different forms that advocacy can take on by interviewing outstanding advocates in various professional, personal, and volunteer roles. Each of these guests have had great wisdom to share about what it means to be an advocate and ways that you, the listener, can advocate and support ongoing efforts in your own life. Today, I am joined by Katrina Young. Katrina is a tireless advocate in the many different roles she takes on. I know her personally as a mother to a son with a genetic disease, cystic fibrosis, which my younger brother also has. Katrina is the chair of the board at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, San Diego chapter, a CF advocate, and most recently was elected to the San Diego Union High School District School Board, and then among many other roles. Katrina has been an inspiration in my own life as she is the person who first got me involved in advocacy at the age of 16 with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I had a great time going to DC with her and her daughter for a National Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill, which was a life-changing experience for me, so I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much for being here. And welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. So to start off, tell us just a little bit about your background and how you ended up getting into advocacy in the first place. Well, as you mentioned, I am, I'm actually a mom of three. My oldest son, Sean, has cystic fibrosis, so just like your brother, James. And when you are giving a chronic progressive and, you know, life-threatening diagnosis of your son, you do everything possible for them. And so the best thing I was told I could do for my son was to educate people because once people understood what you, what was important to you, then they would be willing to support you in your efforts, whether it be fundraising or advocacy efforts or, you know, just being a supportive friend. So my advocacy really started way back when I was a new mom and just talking about my son's disease and sharing what it meant to him and what it meant to our family. I'm always trying to be careful not to, you know, there's that balance between a private life and giving out information, but the end result is so important. We are so fortunate. I know your brother has had the same benefit that because of advocacy efforts, we have literally watched medical science literally transform before our eyes for where a disease that we were terrified of. Now we believe that it actually can be managed and there's even greater hope that, you know, more can be done. Just in the 20 years that we've lived with this disease, I've seen the benefits of our advocacy efforts. There aren't words to describe that. So it really does show the importance and the power of a story. Yeah, and that is so true. And I think just even realizing that at an individual level, advocacy is so important, but then seeing just everyone come together, like for the national advocacy days that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has put on, it is just so powerful and moving to see hundreds of people come together and you just really see that there is a push for change and then seeing the change happen. So it's incredible and it takes those individual steps turning into a bigger movement and as part of a community. So yeah, it's awesome. And you should know too that when I actually started to do more actual true advocacy in terms of meeting with, you know, congressmen or people who had like more legislative power, I hadn't done a lot of that, but my daughters had signed up for that national advocacy event. They, you know, they came prepared with, they had done their research and they asked very, you know, intelligent questions and, you know, had very specific asks that they wanted to see for their brother and for 30,000 other people with cystic fibrosis. And then I saw you, you know, who are a very eloquent spokesperson for your brother. And I remember sitting there thinking and watching the adults in the room actually listen to the kids in the room and taking notes and asking them questions. I mean, you were the true leaders in the room. And I I remember thinking, well, my daughters are brave enough to do this and you at 16 are brave enough to do this and I need to be brave enough to do this. So then that prompted me to do more. So I, I think it's kind of a neat experience as a mother that I learned a lot from my own children. So not only was I advocating for my son, but I learned from my daughters who were brave enough and kind enough to teach me to do the same. I think it's a good lesson that I'm young or old, you know, there's always a room for your voice. And sometimes even the youngest voices have the most power. That is so true. And I think for a lot of people like in college or high school are kind of trying to figure out where they're really going in life. It can seem really daunting to be like, okay, where does advocacy even begin? How do I jump into this giant thing? It's so broad in general, but I think just truly finding those areas you're passionate about and really educating yourself. Advocacy is as much as, you know, educating others, like you were saying when you first started off as a mother and just teaching people in your life what CF meant or going to Capitol Hill. And so, yes, I definitely appreciate the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the Teen Advocacy Days because I think that 
not only myself and your daughters, but just all the teenagers who have gone through that program are better off for it in a lot of ways. It was really educational. So my next question for you are, what are some of the lessons you have taken away from being a cystic fibrosis advocate and how has it opened doors to other opportunities for you? I think to me, advocacy, especially in terms of medical science and the impact it has on human lives, it's shown me the power of human kindness. It's kind of scary to put yourself out there. And my store was always so well received by others. And when you ask someone to do something for you and you kind of feel very vulnerable but when people come back at you with kindness and say of course you know I'm going to help because you know I'd be doing the same thing if I were in your shoes and just the amounts of kindness that people show and their willingness to help others that's been hugely rewarding and just been a great lesson you know not that's surprising but it's just it's very rewarding to watch and how it's helped me with other things is I think that the more people give you, the more you want to give back. So I felt like we've had hundreds of people show up in support of my son for an annual walk that we do. And you're so grateful for the community and their support that you want to do something to show how grateful you are. So I started volunteering more in my community. So I volunteered at schools and, you know, became PTA president and, you know, Girl Scout leader. And I did different things because one, I enjoyed it. I enjoy working with kids and I'm passionate about kids, but at the same time, I also wanted to reflect my gratitude that so many people had given me in their support. And it's a good feeling to be able to give as much as you feel that you've received. Yeah, for sure. And I think because like none of this would be possible without community, just getting through the hard times, the good times, everything in between. It's the cystic fibrosis community is very strong. And I'm so thankful that even like in San Diego, we have such a great bond with one another throughout the nation. There are people we've connected with and it truly is just mind blowing to see time and time again, how great human beings can be when you're just kind of like afraid and vulnerable. And I think definitely your story speaks to that. You bring up a good point too, that the CF community is a very tight knit community. There's a strong sense of connection. And I think that's one of the reasons behind its success, you know, that it's, it's genuine. People do care about each other. I started volunteering for my son, but then, you know, I started hearing stories like your brother and, you know, other people in our community and then across the United States and everyone who I shared my story with in the community was working for themselves as well as my son, as well as others. And we kind of built a network amongst ourselves. And I think because we truly care about everyone in the community, I think that's allowed us to do more. Yeah. For those listeners who don't know much about cystic fibrosis or the CF foundation, I think it just really speaks to the power of people coming together because cystic fibrosis is a rare disease. 30,000 people in the U.S. have it. But it just really shows the power of people coming together and making change because I feel like a lot of times people who are wanting to go into advocacy are like, okay, well, is it worth my time? Am I really making a difference? But it's when you join those ongoing efforts and join with other people with the same passions and cause that I think really just propels change and helps make the world a little bit of a better place, a little bit at a time. Yep, definitely. Yeah. So this links to my next question and it's definitely more general, but what would you say advocacy means to you? You've been an advocate in various different roles and what are some of the common themes in your experiences? I think what I would start with first is what I don't think it is and what you assume it is at first is that you think it's so scary or it's this very formal process. You think of, you know, suits and ties and sitting down with, you know, important people and it is on some level, but it, um, it can be as simple as wearing a t-shirt. I mean, I've, gotten more, um, I've been able to talk to more people about cystic fibrosis just by wearing a t-shirt from an event I've attended. And, and that just sparks a conversation. And so I think any time that you care about something, the, the different ways that you can support it, and you don't have to travel all the way out to DC and sit down. It's, it's an honor to do so. And it's a great experience, but you can also do that in your own hometowns. You, it's very easy to reach out to your elective representatives. I found that they're always, um, almost without exception, very welcoming and they want to learn more. And you, all you have to do is Google them and their their email address is right there and you can send them something that you're concerned about or you want to, them to know more about. And I've been able to set up meetings here in, in my hometown of San Diego. And so it can be very, very simple and very easy. And 
It doesn't have to involve travel or expense or suits or even, you know, scary meetings in big plush conference rooms. <laughs> so I, I guess that common themes of what I've seen is probably just that, is that when you're talking about something that we're all humans, that even if you're talking to elective official, it doesn't matter if they're the president of the United States or the mayor of your city or, you know, school board member or anyone else that, you know, we're all human beings. At the end of the day, they're going to relate to you as a person. So if you can just have a warm heart to heart conversation with you, what it means to you personally, they're always going to understand and respect that. And you never know what kind of a difference you'll make just by being brave enough to just say, this is my story and this is what I feel. And knowing that they actually generally want to know. Yeah. And I think that's just so powerful because there are so many different levels that you can get involved. Like you said, you don't have to travel all the way out to DC. You can email your representative, you can call your representative, or you can, you know, go schedule a meeting. I remember we did an advocacy day in San Diego together. I went with you and yeah. our chapter. And that for me, I think was my first advocacy experience. And I remember being like, what? I can talk to my elected representatives in this way. And so I think just for listeners out there realizing that you can take small steps and you can take big steps and it's really just up to you and advocacy takes on so many different forms. So this next question is a little bit geared more towards some of your other roles. I think your story really highlights how receiving from your community, like you were saying, the fact that you were getting so much from your community and just wanting to give back. I think your story and the different roles you've taken on speak to how advocacy in one area can lead to community involvement and community engagement in other areas. It isn't really restricted. You can be an advocate in many different fields. And so what made you decide to run for school board and what was the election season and process like, especially during this past election season? I'm just genuinely curious and I want to hear more about what made you decide to go into that community service role. To be honest, I decided on my 50th birthday, so, you know, last January, so like a year and a few months ago, we were on a family vacation and it was snowing outside and I was reading um, Michelle Obama's book, oh, um, Becoming, and she very eloquently talks about how doors had been opened for her, for her to have the opportunities that she had, and then she felt that in return, she, not that she felt that she had to, but she felt compelled or wanted to open doors for others, kind of like I open the door for you and then you open the door for someone else and it's a chain reaction. And it just, the way she said it just so moved me. And I just remember thinking, you know, my, my kids were just about out of high school. I had a wealth of experience, I believe, from volunteering in schools, serving on sport as the Fibrosis Foundation. And everything kind of seemed to come together. And I felt that not only would I enjoy doing, but I felt that I might have some skills that would lend to it, or at least I hope that I would. So I threw my name in the ring and I ran. I knew that we were going into COVID as closer to the election got. I didn't realize how hard this year would be. I don't think any of us really truly understood how hard this year would be. And, you know, to be frank and honest, so I think anyone in any elected role and anyone who went through the campaign cycle this year would say it was hard because decisions were important. And that's what I learned is to step back anytime something felt really hard or I felt like this is a lot to take on, then you kind of step back and you say, but that just means it's all the more important. So then you just kind of regroup and you figure out a way to work it out. So I came on, won my election, and I was sworn in in uh, mid-December. And it was kind of at the height of the pandemic where schools were still closed, our case numbers were going up, and rightfully so, there were people who wanted different things. I quickly learned, and I knew this from all my advocacy, and I think that was probably the best training I had, is that I had done so much talking to people about what I hope to have accomplished that I in my role was able to reflect that and treat everyone how I would want to have been treated or how I felt I had been treating it. Even if I didn't agree with someone's position, you know, I listened intently to make sure that they didn't have something to say that I didn't know or that, you know, they might change my opinion. So I treated every conversation as kind of a clean slate. And, and I think at the end of the day, even if people 
don't agree with others. I think they just want to be heard, especially when something important is going on. You know, I've done so much advocacy for my son's health, and a lot of parents were advocating for their son, for their children's education, and you know, which both have lifelong repercussions. To always respect the importance of the decisions that I'm facing and to always be respectful that there's always going to be multiple perspectives. And that's a good thing. Like if we all agreed, it would be kind of boring and maybe not in the best interest of all of us. So, you know, disagreements are actually a good thing. Someone said, and I think it's very true that, you know, smart, compassionate people can disagree with each other. And I think that's one of my biggest lessons I've learned from this year. I mean, we've saw it from the very top ticket of our election all the way down to like the more local school boards is that there is a lot of opinions and a lot of emotion. But at the end of the day, we believe the things we do because we're informed and because we care. And I think if we can kind of come back to that thing that unifies us, I think we'll get out at the end better than how we entered, hopefully. So that's my wish. But it's definitely been an experience now that we're kind of coming out towards the end of it. It's been really rewarding. I feel like I've learned a lot of valuable lessons and now we kind of see the rewards. I was visiting school campuses last week and things that I didn't see even a few weeks prior, definitely a few months prior that kids on campuses and they're smiling and they're laughing and they're interacting and teachers are happy and engaged and to see that much joy and people doing what they want to be doing. It's, it was powerful and very emotional to see all that. So at the end of the day, hopefully um, you could say, I feel good about all that we've accomplished. And, and I do feel that. I hope that continues. <laughs> yeah. And I think that also just really speaks to the fact that advocacy is about, you know, holding your own ground, but also really just truly listening to the voices around you. And it's clear from your role that, you know, there's a lot going on this year. My mom's a principal. She's, I've heard many of stories. I'm a college student who's like, okay, wow, this is all online and it all changed really quickly. But just knowing that there are people listening is really great, whether it's on like a local level, a congressional level, there are people there to listen and that being an advocate is important in making sure that your concern is heard because most likely your concern isn't just particular to you. It's probably the concern of a lot of other folks. So I definitely appreciate hearing that and hearing about what a crazy year it's been. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We're going to look back at this in a few months and just be like, what on earth was that? <laughs> But at the same time, like we've all said that, you know, there's silver linings that came out of us. And I think we've learned that technical advancements are going to have more of a role in education. And I think we're all going to value interpersonal relationships. You know, I know we're doing this by Zoom and that's always going to be in podcasts, but the next time we get to see each other in person, it just makes it that much better. We will continue to come out of this stronger than we did and more connected, despite the fact that we've been so separated for so long. I agree. Yeah, there's... Definitely so much technology education wise, even just like in healthcare, being able to go talk to your doctor, like a virtual appointment. It's so bizarre. And especially I think for, I mean, going back to the CF community, we both have experience with that. That's such just a wild thing to be able to have your doctor right there on the telephone right. and talk to them. And so, yeah, it's really amazing at the same time. What a weird year, but yes, you're definitely <laughs> right. That's a good so one. Cheers to 2022, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so just to wrap things up, my last question is more practical for listeners out there, but just from your experiences, what advice would you give to people looking to be advocates in their own lives for different causes or just wanting to support ongoing advocacy efforts, but they don't know how? I know we talked a little bit about reaching out to your representatives and other things like that. Personal advice, I would say follow your heart. The reason probably why someone wants to advocate for something is that they believe in it or they care about something. So, you know, if you follow your heart, you're never going to go wrong. And then within that, I would say that I think there's this expectation of what it should be or what who you should be in it. And I think it's important for people to know that they don't have to be anything other than who they are. Just tell your story, share what's important to you, be as honest and transparent as you can. And, you know, just like following your heart, that will always steer you in the right direction. In terms of getting more involved, I think, I mean, there's so many different great ways to be involved. Obviously, I'm biased towards the, the Sister Fibrosis Foundation, and I've done a lot of work with education. So those are two passions of mine. But 
I mean, there, you know, there's a whole host of different ways that people can make this world a better place. And, you know, there's so much technology out there that a simple Google search will show you any numbers of qualified charities out there that you can support or issues that need, you know, powerful voices. And any organization would welcome a volunteer with open arms. So, you know, whether it's helping students or volunteering for animals or doing something for healthcare, find an organization that you think sounds like it's, it allows you to follow your heart and they most likely can help steer in the direction of next steps. They can tell you more about what you need to know about that organization and what are important things that they want members of Congress or even the local mayor to know about. And they, they most likely will be able to steer you in the right direction. And again, it can be as simple as just wearing a t-shirt saying, I adopted a dog today, um, all the way to, you know, looking for a political candidate, whatever, you know, everything in between, like it can be so simple or it could be more complex. And, you know, that's the beauty of it. The choice is yours. And you get to kind of pick and choose what you have the resources for and what you have the time for. And I guess to start small, like you don't have to fly to Washington D.C. and the first time that you want to do something, you and I met and got coffee the first time and we just talked and and that's kind of what started it. So you didn't just automatically pack up your bags and travel to our capital. You know, we started with coffee and, and then it grew from there. So I think if you start small, follow your heart and just speak your own truth throughout the whole process, you're going to look back and be really proud of what you've done. I love that. And I think to me, that's a really great takeaway that just figure out what you're passionate about and take some small steps forward. And whether it be what you're doing for your career in the future or currently ways you can use that to be an advocate, ways you can volunteer, ways you can just use your own personal experiences. I think that's just really great advice, especially for people looking to get started. And there are so many things you could be an advocate for, but figuring out what ways you can use your own passions and talents and knowledge to just really further other efforts. Thank you for that advice. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. And thank you so much for being on the show, Katrina. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It's so nice to catch up with you. (laughs) Yeah. I I always enjoy working with you. And I always enjoy hearing what's going on in your life. And I'm proud of all that you're accomplishing too. So thank you for all that you're doing. This is its own way of advocacy. And I know that you're going to inspire other people your age and older to, um, to do more. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that.